Well, colleagues, it's the big moment, final lecture, and it, it's a absolutely huge. I can't tell you how big of an honor it is for me to introduce Professor Kate Nation as our new career prize lecturer. And I'm, I must say that when the committee approached me to see if I might be interested in serving as the president, literally the first thing into my head was the idea that I'd get to introduce Kate. Um, so it is really a huge uh, privilege, and it's a privilege because Kate is such an important friend and collaborator. And for a long time, she's been an inspiration to me, and I know to so many others, um, of what a great academic career should look like. And we've heard already through the symposium and all through the conference about Kate's uh, scientific contributions. And in terms of her international scientific reputation, Kate has made seminal contributions across a wide range of areas pertaining to how children learn to read. And We've seen how those contributions have spurred work in many directions. Um, for myself, um, helping me rethink how uh, skilled reading arises and how we should rethink that. Um, Kate's work is extraordinarily creative, tackling big, important questions, uh, methods innovation, and still at the core of it with that really elegant uh, experimental psychology um, that's so important to the society. Now, I say that Kate is a, an example of what a great academic career should look like because I personally don't think that that just stops with the science. Kate is a wonderful communicator, and many of you will know that she writes articles for the Times Education Supplements, and the articles that she's written are some of the most read articles in that practitioner magazine. She's also been a, a major force within the hugely successful BBC Children's Writing Competition. And finally, I want to mention Kate's mentorship and supervision. And we heard a little bit of this from, from Matthew, but the quality of our field has advanced because of the people that Kate has trained. And I think that that's really important. Um, and I know there's so many people here today that are grateful for Kate's supervision and her mentorship, um, many of whom have even gone on to win EPS prizes, as we've seen earlier in this meeting. So Kate, it's a huge honor to have you here as our mid-career prize lecturer. Um, we're really looking forward to what you have to say. So, welcome Kate. Oh dear. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you very much, EPS, for, for um, this huge honour. Um, there's many, many reasons why I'm pleased to be standing here today. Uh, not least because I am standing here. I know there are people on Zoom, but it's very nice to have our uh, first in-person EPS uh, meeting. And I really just want to pay credit to what the EPS, the Society, and particularly the committee uh, under the Cathy's leadership and also John Dun Duncan, the previous president, particular shout out to Heather, who's not only just kept the show on the road during lockdown, but actually the EPS has gone from strength to strength in finding new and creative ways to spend the money in the service of supporting psychological science and particularly supporting young people's careers as they develop and grow up like many of us have, we grow up with the EPS. So many reasons to be grateful, but actually I have an, another type of reason, which might, I'm not sure if it's unique to me here, but... Um, a unique reason for me, anyway, for being here is, is the location. Um, the slides aren't moving forward. Oh. Ah. Yeah, because here we are in Staffordshire, and I am from Staffordshire, so I'm very much on home territory. I'm from the southern part of the county where it but, uh, butts with um, the West Midlands, with the black country, so I, I grew up... Um, around about there, about 30 miles down the road. If you came on the train from Birmingham up here, so I'm uh, a little bit out of Birmingham. If you've ever been on the M6, sort of round about where the IKEA is in a massive traffic jam, then you, you know, that, 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 that's, my, that's my location. So I'm very happy to be giving this talk at the EPS in, in my um, home county. And I was trying to think, is there a way that I can draw on something from Staffordshire to sort of, you know, theme through my lecture or, or to situate my work. I was trying to think, what's Cena Staffordshire famous for? And the first thing I thought of was Robbie Williams. And I thought, no, 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 that won't, that won't do. Um, but then I thought about the Staffordshire knot. So uh, I think it's on the university's logo. And uh, I thought about the Staffordshire knot and could I do something with this? And I, 
I remember a story about the Staffordshire Knot was that it's something to do with the, an executioner who wanted to execute three people at the same time and he, he didn't have enough rope but he came up with this knot that he could uh, do away with three people at the same time. I have no idea whether that's true or not. And when I was thinking of the Staffordshire Knot, I was thinking I learned to tie one and I also wore one when I was a little brownie and I thought, well, I wonder if I can find a picture of me in my brownie uniform showing my uh, Staffordshire Knot. And I've got one. It doesn't show the Staffordshire knot, so I was tempted not to show it, but then I thought, well, you all need a little bit of 1970s. <laughs> little, little, little Kate there. So here she is back there, back in Staffordshire. And the knot theme is going to continue a, li a little bit because learning to read and thinking about reading, it's a complex, knotty problem. And that's because reading, I think um, Noam said it in his talk this afternoon, reading is a complex, high-level behaviour. Reading is everything. Imagine our lives without the ability to read. And when we think about reading as a psychological problem, we might be interested in the orientation of features within a letter and very low-level aspects, like physical aspects of, uh, of dealing with the visual stimuli. Or we might be interested in things much more to do with um, abstracting meaning and constructing mental states of characters in text. It's absolutely what we mass massive what we do when we read. Reading it is a com com complex, tightly tied knot. And therefore, learning to read is a knotty problem. It's a massive thing that we expect uh, our children to do. And yet most children, with instruction, with time, are able to read. But I think the complex knotty problem, you know, as experimental psychologists, obviously what we do is we tease it apart and we try and work on our little one bit of it. And that's really led to some sort of dichotomies in the study of reading, which are very understandable, but I think also are problematic at the same time. So I just wanted to start the talk by thinking about some of these dichotomies. And a big one is between um, a broad division between people who work and theories and methods about word recognition versus theories and methods to do with text comprehension. Obviously, reading is about both of these things, but we tend to study them in isolation. We're either a sort of nerdy, wordy person or a text dorky person. I think it's Charles Perfetti, th those are his words. And we don't meet as often as we should. And we should because reading is about bringing these two things together. And the way we often think about bringing these two things together is that efficient word reading is needed to fuel the important task of reading, which is reading comprehension. And then um, we can think about learning to read as about developing these orthographic representations that allow good word reading. And then the rest of reading comprehension, after we've sorted out you know, the minor problem of how we recognise words so well, that then all becomes the domain of language comprehension. It sort of comes for free because we, ha we are able to communicate and produce and understand language. Now, broadly, this is evidently true. But also, it's also wrong, or at least simplifying in ways that I think have been a little bit constraining and a little bit unfortunate. Another dichotomy, and Cathy's touched on this in her talk this afternoon, is that there's a sort of split between people who study children and are interested in the child as a unit and how they grow up and how they learn and develop over time versus those working in a more psycholinguistic tradition where the unit there is often the word or the phrase or the whatever bit of language it is that you're interested in. You're not really interested in the people, your participants. You're interested in the processes that you abstract from those people around the item, you know, whereas those in development tend to be more interested in the participants and the words are just to you know, make up the experiment. And related to that, the dichotomy between working in a tradition where you think about learning and development versus a tradition where you think about processing and how you might devise and implement uh, cognitive models, computational models, and so on. Whereas in reading development, people have thought more about learning and, and how you move children from not being able to read to being able to read. And the learning tradition gets us a long way. So here we've got some longitudinal data, individual participants shown on here from a study by uh, Lervag and colleagues. So we've got these sort of growth curves, and we, in the learning tradition we have to try and understand what's going on there. And that sort of field of reading development work is characterised by data analysis that looks a little bit like this. Um, massive structural equation models which in many ways are hugely impressive. So this is a, a model that's trying to look at the, the factors that are associated with good reading comprehension. It tells us how complex comprehension is when we build a model that looks, well, they build a model that looks like this. And these are impressive. They capture 95% of the variance is captured by these sorts of statistical analyses. 
But I think in this audience, I probably wouldn't have to do any convincing uh, or much convincing to say that we can only get so far with data like this if we want to actually understand how learning happens. For that, we need experiments that have more exploratory power as opposed to analyses that capture variants. Important, though, that is to the field. We need to complement these um, approaches. And in the interest of sort of... Um, complementing things, I've borrowed a slide from Lena, she's here somewhere, from Lena, from, Lena Blot, from Lena Blot, who's been thinking really carefully about how we can build bridges and unite some of these dichotomies. On the one hand, we've got the experimental research tradition that many of us are, are working within. The other hand, we've got the individual, the individual differences tradition. And these are not necessarily comfortable bedfellows, if I might borrow, borrow Dorothy Bishop's uh, expression there in that the type of experiment we do, what we ask of the data, the way that we use our analytic tools, is by definition very different in these two traditions. And bringing them together isn't a, a simple way when we have to think about variance and we have to think about reliability. And we had a lovely overview of some of that in the context of uh, Jennifer Murphy's talk last night. But we have to try and build these bridges. We need to accept the tension between them, but we also have to try and find methods and approaches that allow us to do both at the same time if we want to understand development. So going back to the, to the knotty problem, we need to untie the knot if we to understand the processes that bring about the knot. And I think that's what's led to this sort of dichotomization and thinking of things with these very different methods and approaches. So we can think of that you know, more like the untied Staffordshire knot. But then we have to pull them together again. We have to retie the dichotomies and understand, psychologically, understand the complex behaviour as, as greater than the sum of its parts, because reading is greater than the sum of its parts. So with that as background then, let me go on to what I'd like to talk about this evening. What I'd like to talk about really is how we learn or what, what the issues are about learning from reading experience. So in one sense, we can think about reading experience as practice. And in a way, that makes sense. Reading is a complex skill. We know complex skill, you have to practice. And learning from reading experiment, to some extent, is about practice. But I think it's about much, much more than that, which is much more integral to thinking about reading. And that is that by reading practice and by reading experience, children have rich exposure to written language. So I'd like <coughs> us to think about how that uh, sort of drives learning but also how it's, what, how it's a reflection of learning as well as a driver of it. Then I'm going to go on and talk about particular properties of uh, written language, um, book language as we're calling it, and think about the properties of the text and how that might also shape learning. And I'm going to put these two things together at the end with an example from uh, some recent work looking at morphology and word recognition. So let's think about reading and what young children look like. Some of you might have seen this when it did the rounds on Twitter a, a couple of years ago. So this is what I'm not going to talk about, um, but I can't resist uh, showing it. And I don't know if the technology will work. Let's give it a go. So it's so wonderful. Uh, he, he knows his letters. He cannot read. Um, I think we'll all agree that that's not reading. That said, he's probably not too far away from being able to get from saying the, the letters out loud to blending them together in a way that, that he is reading, this sort of solving the decoding problem. And as was noted in the earlier symposium, the, the field knows quite a lot about decoding and how that happens and what has to happen to make Nutella turn into Nutella rather than peanut butter. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to take that as read and think about kids who've, who've made this uh, initial transition. And Oops. Oh, oh let's watch again. <laughs> What we want is reading that looks like this. We need a Matilda. We need kids who are reading lots and are able to not, you know, not just read, uh, what's the expression? They're not just learning to read, they're reading to learn. So think about what needs to develop and how that develops to have that sort of transition from being a novice to being an expert. And two things are needed, I think. One is instruction. I'll come back to this right at the end. But no amount of sitting in a library with the most beautiful books in the world is going to make a child a reader if they can't do the basic decoding elements of reading. Otherwise, they'll be saying peanut butter forever. So instruction is clearly important. 
but also experience and practice. And I hope by the end of the talk I'll have convinced you that thinking about experience and practice isn't boring, it isn't all about rote learning and, and practice as something much richer, much more psychologically interesting than um, uh, in, in, with respect to practice. And I think this is also an interesting way to think about the problem of learning to read, because if we understand how kids learn via experience, that gives us an opportunity to use that knowledge to devise reading schemes, reading books, curriculum materials that are optimised for learning because they take with them the principles of what we understand in terms of how learning and memory happens. Because written stimuli, like many stimuli, we all use them in our experiments, even if we're not interested in reading, um, you know, they, they are obeying the principles of learning and memory, and so uh, we can perhaps use those more effectively in instruction. So the way I'm going to be thinking about experience and learning from experience is via this loop between what I'm calling a processing encounter and a learning opportunity. So the idea here would be that children encounter a word, maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time, but they process it and they do something with it. They read it, they think about it, they um, repeat it, they spell it. There's some sort of processing encounter with that particular word in a particular episode, a particular context. And this provides a learning opportunity via that encounter. Having done that learning opportunity, that has the, the possibility that it might change something about the system because it's updated the knowledge in some way. So that next time that word is encountered, or next time that letter is encountered, or next time that morpheme is encountered, it's a little bit different to how it was before. You, you push the system a little bit by exposing it to something new, learning from it, and that feeds back so that when you see the word for the next time, things aren't the same as they were n minus 1. And if we think about this loop going on through uh, over time, over developmental time, then we can think about reading development being a consequence of this processing encounter learning opportunity loop through, town, through time. So I thought I'd give an example of this, an empirical example of this, uh, going right back to the last century and in fact to the very first experiments that I ran in my very first publication from my PhD work back in 1996. So this is definitely the, uh, the dark ages. And the question you hear is, you hear a nonsense word like peem, and you hear it for the first time, how would you spell the word peem? We could all do this, but many of us would have variation in what we choose to write. Because there are numerous spellings that are licensed for the vowel E. We can spell it as in beat, street, ski, theme, sheep, and so on. Lots and lots of different ways you can spell it. So if you're asked to spell a nonsense word containing that vowel, what, what do people do? And this, is, this, is, this was what I spent my uh, three years PhD uh, doing with, using um, five-year-old kids who were just beginning to learn how to read and write. So in one of the experiments, they'd hear nonsense, what's, hear nonsense words like these, and then I'd look at what they, um, how they chose to spell them. So we've got grebe, peem, and treen. So that's what they were asked to spell. And in some conditions in the experiment, they'd just sort of hear, somewhat incidentally, earlier in the list, a word. So, for example, in this case, it's the word green. So think about the word, they don't hear it, they wouldn't see it written down, but they hear the word green, which was a word that they could already read and write. Just hearing a word green a few moments ago do anything to change how children would spell those nonsense words. And the hypothesis was that it might do, in that for the uh, nonsense words grebe, we've got an overlap in the initial consonant and vowel. So does that make kids more likely to spell grebe? with a double E. Similarly, if there's a vowel overlap, are they more likely to spell peem as with a double E? And likewise for the VC, the vowel consonant overlap at the end. And here are the data from that experiment. First of all, in the, um, in the unrelated condition, where the prime word that they heard before was unrelated in sound and spelling. And what's plotted is the, um, the number of times that the nonsense word was spelled with a double E choice in the prime condition and the baseline condition. And you can see they sometimes use double E, but it wasn't affected by condition or by prime. It was different, though, in the related prime condition. So here, something about hearing the word green influenced how these non-words were spelled a few minutes later, in that there were more double E spellings in the prime condition relative to baseline and relative to the un unrelated prime condition. <coughs> So let's have a think about how we might uh, attempt to um, accommodate those data in a theoretical model. 
And like other speakers today, I'm going to situate the talk within this sort of triangle framework, although Padre, note, it's knowing its correct orientation. It's not doing a quirky movement <laughs> in a most dashing manner to the, to, to the, to the side. Um, so here we've got the, the, the triangle model of, uh, of reading. We can think about the representations that underpin reading as being those concerned with orthography, the letters, um, phonology, the sounds of words, and then semantics, the, meaning, the meanings of words, broadly speaking. And if we think about the mappings of these different sets of representations, these have a different nature and quality to them. So first of all, think about mappings between phonology and semantics. So these, this is spoken language. There's no orthography involved. And certainly when we're talking about um, monomorphemic words, these are arbitrary. So the form, the phonological form green, doesn't map in any systematic way to the semantics of the word, except they are associated together. They are one denotes the other. But there's nothing systematic about the sound of green that makes it green. It just is green. So those are somewhat arbitrary. And of course, things are very different when we get, begin to think about the mappings between orthography and phonology, between sounds and spellings. Because even in a language where we all might write, raise our hands and say, oh, goodness, English is terrible, of course the connections between orthography and phonology are highly systematic and quasi-regular. The spelling is predictable from the sound and vice versa. So here, the sound of the word green is related in a systematic way to its spelling, and, of course, also to alternative spellings that are licensed by our writing system. So we could spell green in different ways, it's just that one of them happens to be conventional. And once this model has learned something about orthography and phonology, these various different spellings become um, uh, reflected in the weights on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on those mappings, essentially in a frequency-related type way. And then we can think about the mappings between orthography and semantics, these direct connections from spelling to meaning. So here these are mappings that would go from the orthographic form of green, not the sound, but the letters, to the colour green. So in our experiment then what we did was to give kids these nonsense words to read, uh, to spell, actually it was in spelling in this experiment. Now in theory they could spell them in any way that's licensed by the knowledge that has been accumulated in these mappings between orthography and phonology. They could spell them as I've listed here, green, 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 in various different ways, and indeed they did in this experiment, and that can all be accommodated by the mappings between orthography and phonology, and the variation, frequency-related variation, that the model has become um, uh, aware of through training. Interestingly, though, when we present orally the spoken form of the word green, that did something to adjust the spellings. So they didn't spell them the same way that they did at baseline. Instead, something about that lexical representation of green is activated and does something to alter the spelling, which might indicate something from a more sort of semantic level, perhaps, filtering down and influencing the connections between orthography and phonology. So from this very old experiment, we can think about that in this processing encounter learning opportunity loop. So you have your processing opportunity, uh, your processing encounter, the experimenter says spell the word peem, and you have to spell it, that's what you have to do. You obviously draw on your knowledge that you already have about how the sounds uh, and letters map together in your language, and the learning opportunity goes round. And in the condition where you hear the lexical prime, the processing encounter and the learning opportunity from that processing encounter is different. And that is going to adjust your weight somewhat in the system because you've now had an example of when you spell a nonsense word with the letters double E. And that is something that sort of adds to the accumulation of knowledge in your system that you benefit from as time goes on. So I hope that gives a flavour of what I mean by this um, process and encounter learning opportunity loop. And really these ideas have sort of stayed with me over, over the years and sort of got written down in a slightly more formal way in this um, review paper in 2017 where I really sort of tried to write down what had been going around in my head for a few years about thinking about the importance of reading experience and trying to detach it from a rather mundane notion of practice. And that's because reading gives children access to written language. It provides exposure to words across different contexts and different episodes, all sorts of different things once you're up and reading. And that these provide the statistics that change the system and sum to something that's very rich and very nuanced, absolutely massive. I mean, we read loads, we read all the time, a massive database about how written language works. And so we become sensitive to the patterns in the input 
and I hope I'll set up in a, in a few minutes um, evidence as to why this is both a reflection of reading ability, but it's also the driver of reading ability. And we can think about this at various different levels. We can think about uh, context-dependent grapheme phoneme correspondences, we can think about words, we can think about morphemes, we can think about syntactic structures. They're all regularities that are in the input that's provided by exposure to the written language. And the other thing that reading experience does, it allows us to accumulate some sort of item-level statistics uh, that to some extent are then the emergent property of reading experience. And I'll come on to hopefully give an example of um, what I mean by that in a moment. So here we can think we can keep this idea that efficient, context-independent word reading is really critical to reading comprehension. Of course it is. You can't do reading comprehension if you can't recognise the words. That front-end is fundamental and absolutely non-negotiable. But reading experience, so the lexical legacy idea goes, is also driving word reading experience. It's also a driver of learning, not just a consequence of learning. So let me illustrate this with a, 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 a straightforward example of frequency. We all know about frequency effects. Frequency effects are everywhere. They're ubiquitous. Nearly every task, every experiment we do that has a frequency um, a manipulation in it, we find a frequency uh, effect. It's a powerful lexical statistic um, that's reflected, as I say, in lexical processing across many different tasks. Higher frequency words are easier to read, spell, remember, and so on. Generally, frequency is, is, is calculated by counting the word, number of words across a large language corpora, like the British National Corpus or something. And the idea here would be that words that occur most often in such a corpus are more likely to be encountered by people, and then, therefore, this gives them some privileged um, status in a processing model. And relating to this to children, we certainly see clear frequency effects very early on in development in children's own reading behaviour. Just now I want to go on to uh, an experiment where we manipulated frequency as a, as a learning variable, partly to talk a little bit more about frequency, um, mainly though to, to just um, uh, reference my long collaboration with Anne Castle, shown here. Um, the gentleman in the middle is not Philip Angel. Uh, <laughs> this, is some, this is some dude that we picked up at an Escot meeting in, um, where was it, San Sebastian a few years ago. Um, and he had a book, so we had to take a photograph. So in this experiment, very much modelled after work by David Sher, some of you might know, but we inserted target non-words into passages, short stories that the kids read, and frequency was manipulated within this experiment. So they saw the word once, twice or four times, depending on the exposure condition. So an example here would be the nonsense word yate, and they read in a line, no attention is drawn to it, they read the little story about yate being the coldest city in the world. Then there's a test phase at some point later, it might be straight away, in this experiment it was a day later, and then a week later for a delayed post-test, oh, my slides have taken on a life of their own, um, and... Um, the data I'm going to show you come from an orthographic choice task where they had to say which is the coldest city in the world. Is it Yate or is it Yate? Now obviously both of those answers are correct if you're just doing phonological decoding, if you're just sounding the word out. But to get the answer correct you have to remember something about the precise orthographic form Y-A-I-T rather than Y-A-T-E. And so we looked at performance on this orthographic choice task as a function of frequency. And here are the data, and what you can see on both one-day post-test and also seven-day post-test is a sort of clear learning effect, but also a clear frequency effect, with, one, um, with four exposures being better than two exposures being better than one exposure. Perhaps nothing surprising in the data there, this effect of frequency, some decline of knowledge over time, but not much. So we've got learning, uh, some declines over time, we've got a frequency effect, and we can think of this frequency effect as being a, a, a product of this processing encounter learning opportunity loop. And from that we can think what knowledge is gained. Now clearly something word specific has been learned here, something about the precise spelling of Y-A-I-T as opposed to just some random spelling associated with, yeah, well not a random spelling but some... Um, legitimate spelling associated with Yate. So something about the orthographic form of that word. And work that's been done in this tradition is very much focused on that aspect of item level, word-specific orthographic information. 
And it's also important to remember that this processing encounter has given us an opportunity for something else, something that is perhaps more important as it accumulates over time. And that's just further evidence, further information about how the writing system works. So learning Yate is the coldest city in the world. We learn about Yates, we learn about cold cities, but we also learn about Ys and Ais and Ts and how they operate in the writing system, such that when we next see a word that has those components, something is a little bit different. It might be tiny, but it must, something might be a little bit different. It might be a good difference, it might be a bad difference, but something will be slightly different. So that's an example of how we can think about word reading behaviour being a driver of reading comprehension, as the classic models tell us it should be. But those reading comprehension exp um, uh, episodes, experiences, provide experience with the written language that comes back and does something. It induces a frequency effect that we can measure in subsequent processing. High frequency words are easier to process. So I want to go on and talk about reading experience beyond the frequency effect now. We've got we can think about frequency in various different ways. So think of a word that has a frequency of 100. That frequency accumulated in classic frequency measures, it might come from one single document that has the word in 100 times, never appears anywhere else in the corpus. Or it might occur once in 100 different documents distributed throughout the corpus. Both of those have the same frequency value, but they have very different distributions associated with it. So it's interesting to think about how this type of processing encounter, uh, where you've got some sort of variation in time or space or context or episodes, does that do anything to influence learning beyond just verbatim repetition? And we've been working on that quite a lot over the last few years. The first data I'm going to show you actually comes from a very new experiment that's just, uh, just been published. And there we looked at the classic spacing effect. So cognitive psychology textbooks tell us about spacing and that learning information spaced over time, distributed over time, tends to be better, stronger than learning that's massed or pushed together over time. So can we, th we can think about this. If we see a word 100 times, does it matter? for learning about that word if it's a hundred times distributed over a number of days versus squashed together in space. We keep frequency contact, uh, constant, but we change the distribution. Does this matter? I've also chosen this experiment. We've done a bit of space and stuff before, but I chose this experiment to, to highlight um, contributions and collaborations with Huan Chen Wang and Sydney Wagner, who are both at uh, Macquarie University in Sydney working with um, and castles, uh, partly just to again highlight many years of friendship and collaboration, but also these amazing um, stimuli that Huan Chen made up for a PhD and are now featuring many experiments from many labs across the world. And this is everybody's favourite, including mine. It's a prey, whatever it is, we put the non word there. It's used to take out the food that you don't like on your plate. It has a tube and two open ends, and it's children's favourite one it takes the peas out of the food and they don't have to eat their vegetables. So in these experiments in this tradition use these sorts of um, inventions to induce training opportunities within an experimental context and see what that does for learning. So this was a very straightforward experiment looking at the spacing effect where each new, new word was seen in four different sentences. It was either in one sentence over four blocks or four times in a single block. So frequency was the same, the distribution differs. And a little bit later they have a, a testing session Again, a variation on orthographic choice, like the Yate Yate example I showed earlier. This was a four alternative first cho false choice. But you can see a very clear spacing effect in the orthographic choice data there on the left-hand side, that children found it easier to recognise the correct orthographic form if they'd seen it four times over blocks rather than four times within it, the same block. So a spatial advantage for recognition. As you can see, we didn't find an effect of spelling in that experiment. So, so much for the spacing effect. I mean, what we've done here, we've, we've kept frequency contact, uh, constant, but we've changed the distribution by pulling it out in time. But seeing words in different contexts isn't just about temporal variation. Well, it might be, but there's other things going on as well when we see words in different contexts and different episodes. Oh, sorry, this is a Mac to PC problem. My little box is not the right size and the font has changed. However, hopefully it's still clear. If you've seen a word in a hundred, once in a hundred different documents, that might add up to varying, seeing the words in very, very different linguistic contexts on each of those occasions. It might not, but it might, might do so. Compared with one time 
sorry, 100 times in the same text where things are going to be much more constant and much more stim uh, similar. So does this type of variation uh, across experience influence how words are learned and, uh, learned and processed? And I'm going to use, oh, all my slides have gone messy now. I'm going to use here an example. Um, this wasn't the example I first had in my slide, but it was one that Matthew had yesterday and Rebecca had this morning, so I thought I'd change to, to keep constant for those, for those of you who were at those two talks. Think about the difference between perjury and predicament. Every time you experience the word perjury, it's likely to be in some sort of broad context about legal situations, something to do with courtrooms or police or somebody misbehaving. It really, it's hard to think of the usage of the word perjury that isn't somehow related to something that's sort of legal and lawful or illegal and unlawful. And that contrasts with a word like predicament. If you try and think about a context where you might use the word predicament, it, it varies a lot more. You can have a predicament about all sorts of things. It's a promiscuous word. I promised Jenny and Cathy I'd get that in, but I'd, I'd say uh, promiscuous. It's a promiscuous word. It hangs out with lots of other words. So predicament and perjury sort of, sort of sum up this idea that the types of context you see a word in vary as a function of reading experience. One way that this has been captured um, is by a metric that's called semantic diversity. Uh, as um, Rebecca reminded us this morning, contextual diversity, semantic diversity, these are terms that are defined and used in different ways across different studies. I'm going to use the, um, both the, the metric and the description uh, that Paul Hoffman and colleagues came up with. It's a statistic that captures the degree of semantic variability in the context in which a particular word has been seen and how it's been used across its lexical history. So it's derived from large corpus analyses of large language samples. A word like perjury here would be low diversity, a word like predicament would be high diversity, and we can reduce this to a single number. And what evidence from adults shows is that words that are higher in semantic diversity are easier to recognise. So a very simple experiment like lexical decision, it's much easier to recognise a highly diverse word than a low diverse word, even when frequency and things like that are held constant. So we took a look at this in children's reading because it seemed to me that this was a really classic example of a learning effect because it's looking at your usage and your experience with words over a word's contextual history, which is equates with sort of developmental history and what an individual child might have experienced. So I was keen to look at this in children's reading and processing, and this work uh, very much led by my uh, collaborator, um, Yaling Shao. So she developed a children's semantic diversity measure using the same methods as, as Hoffman and colleagues. Um, I'm not going to describe how that was done. For you, those of you who know the work, you'll be reminded that they used a method of latent semantic analysis to derive the metric. If you don't know the work, it doesn't matter. Um, but we used a children's corpus of the sorts of things that children might read or do read, and we used that to extract this lexical statistic. And the prediction from this experiment was that if variation in contextual experience matters, a word's semantic diversity should influence how easily it's processed beyond its actual frequency. So it's getting at this idea of 100 times in one context versus 100 times in, in different contexts. So I'm just going to show just one experiment on this theme, um, where the kids were, saw 300 words that ranged in semantic <coughs> diversity and frequency, a lexical decision experiment where, again, all they have to do, the word is in isolation, say yes if it's a word or no if it's a non-word, and we also got the kids to read the words out loud. And what you can see here is clear effects of both frequency and semantic diversity. So this is the reaction time data. Data were analysed continuously, but just plotted here categorically. So we can see that the high diversity words were faster uh, for the kids to respond to, and as were the high frequency words. A clear effects of both frequency and semantic diversity in um, lexical decision reaction time, and also the, the same pattern in accuracy. So words that are higher in diversity are easier to recognise than words that are low in diversity. So, just said, effects of diversity as well as frequency. And this tells us that the context of what, that a word has been experienced in previously influences subsequent lexical processing. So it sort of captures this lexical legacy idea that how well you process a word when you see it in isolation at some point in time is a reflection of your previous encounters with that word over your experience with that word over developmental time. 
and it has to be something about context here. There's discussion and arguments about what that might be, but it isn't just frequency. It's something about your encounters with that word and variation, perhaps, in the usage of that word over its lexical history. This linguistic promiscuity, I got it in twice, um, uh, is seen um, in various different tasks, and it's not necessarily a good thing for processing or a bad thing for processing. It depends on what you're asking the participant to do. Sometimes you can do things that makes the word easier to process. Sometimes you can put the item in a task and make, make the word harder to process. Depends what we're asking the participant to do. But either way, we get this diversity type of influence on children's lexical processing. As I've indicated, there's some discussion in the literature, a really important discussion about what semantic diversity captures, how, should be how it should be calculated, and why, it how, and why and how it tunes lexical representations. So you can see by the dates on the, on the papers here, this is a very active discussion, and um, one where you can see the field really, really moving. And I just sort of echo the point that uh, Cathy made in, in, in her talk today, that you know, this speaks to the need to models to move to really think about semantics in a more serious way, that sort of capture, however they might do it, it's a distributed way, but really try and capture something that's happening in semantics rather than doing it in the sort of rather fudged way that the models do to, to date. Because clearly the action here about what I'm calling semantic diversity is something that feeds into semantics or the contextual experience with words that shapes how semantic knowledge is represented and then how that relates to orthography and phonology. The other point I want to make about this experiment is I think it highlights that we need to take contextual experience seriously, but we also need to take development and learning seriously, because these, by their nature, seem to me to be classic developmental effects that are a consequence of reading experience. I also think that semantic diversity is likely to end up to have a sort of very multivariate uh, nature. Uh, it's not capturing one thing. I think it soaks up a lot of different things that are reflections of the complexity of human language. I think the same for frequency. It isn't just about repetition. It's things that's correlated with frequency. So I think the question to ask is what predicts semantic diversity rather than what diversity is. That's an interesting possible alternative way of trying to shed light on, on the problem. And clearly there's a need to move beyond correlation. We've heard that. We saw it in Matthew's uh, wonderful talk yesterday and Rebecca Norman's lovely talk this morning that we need to create semantic diversity in our experiments if we're really going to understand how it works and we need to do that across different time scales. The experiments are very short term at the moment yet things that we measure in studies like mine and Yarling capture developmental history at scale over lots and lots of time. How we marry those two things experimentally and theoretically isn't yet at all clear, but that work needs to happen. And computational models can get us so far, particularly when they're united with experimental data. I think my sort of current take on the semantic diversity uh, problem or issue um, goes back to the original discussion. Oh, I can't see some of the slides, but um, you shall know a word by a company, the company it keeps. So this was a comment made by a corpus linguist uh, back in 1957, and I think that sort of really captures something about the diversity measure, and that meaning is constructed of a word. It's not something that's an inherent property of the word, it's something that emerges over time by the company that that word keeps, who it hangs out with in its promiscuous little circle. And this historical company and the variation in that historical company comes to influence lexical processing and lexical learning later on. I, th I think the updating model way, of, again, I'm not going to go into details of this, just, but just for the people that know the work, I think the updating idea is an interesting one in that we can think about word reading allows us to comprehend and experience word in connected text. This is clearly reading experience. And when we change the context, it does something to update the system more because we've induced a change. It's salient. We've done something different. And that leads to a better learning opportunity than if we just see the word in the same context again, where there's no need, less need for the system to update. And this updating is helpful because it brings about more change. So that's how I'm sort of currently thinking about semantic diversity as an example of sort of reading experience. But I think there's another way we need to think about reading experience and really um, driven by this semantic diversity project and working on the language corpora, the sort of books that are written for children, has really encouraged us um, collectively to, to look in detail about the nature of children's books. 
because it isn't just reading practice, it isn't just reading experience, it's something much, much more um, important than that uh, would, would highlight, I think, and it's experience with book language. And I just want to end today's lecture by helping, um, uh, by sharing with you some, some recent data where we've taken a really close look at the nature of written language and asked questions about what this might mean in terms of how children learn to read and learn from reading experience. So the, the work I'm going to describe here uh, is spearheaded by Yaling, uh, who I've already mentioned, and also Nikki Dawson, who's hit here today, who's really led on the, the corpus work. It started many years ago, but it really has taken shape and really pushed forward in lockdown, a perfect lockdown project, working with these huge language samples where we don't have to deal with people at all. So we're looking at the uh, content of children's books because this is the substrate across which words and their context are experienced. We might put words into you know, experiments where they flash up one at a time in the on the screen, but reading experience isn't like that. We need to look at children's books if we want to understand how those words uh, behave in those contexts. And to that end, we've been looking developmentally and across different types of corpus, broadly comparing written language and spoken language, but also comparing different types of written language. So here are the different corpora that we've been um, working with. So on the left-hand side, this is a sample of child-directed speech um, targeted at children in the preschool years. So this comes from the Child S database, um, various corpora from the English UK database, 3.8 million words. So this is the sort of spoken language in the home, the classic mother-child interaction type language. So this gives us uh, um, the substrate of what children are hearing in their day-to-day -day conversations in the preschool years. In terms of book language, we've got three different types of uh, corpora. The first one is one that we made ourselves, where um, we looked at children's reading uh, picture books. So these are the sorts of books that we might read to our children in the preschool years. So they're targeted at preschoolers in the context of shared reading. It's quite a small corpus, but it's been big enough to do its job for us. A very happy couple of days at uh, Blackwell's Bookshop in Oxford, buying all these kids' books and, and building a lovely collection. So what we can do there is to compare child-directed speech and book language targeted at children at approximately the same age. So we're comparing the language they experience via listening versus the language that they experience via reading. I mean, they're not reading themselves, but they're being read book language. Then moving along, we've got the reading book corpus, the Oxford Children's Corpus. I mentioned in passing, this is held by Oxford University Press. It's a dynamic corpus. It keeps getting bigger. At the moment, it's at about 47 million words and 21,000 documents. And this captures or includes reading books that kids read, curriculum materials, websites, magazines, various things that kids say, well, written language that kids encounter between the age of about five and the age of about 16. So there we can compare early book language, preschoolers, to the book reading and the book language that really takes off once kids can read themselves. And then finally we've got this absolutely massive corpus of children's writing that comes from the BBC Radio 2's 500 Words competition. This now has over a million stories in it, so that's whatever a million times 500 is, number of words in it, absolutely massive. And that allows us to look at how learning to read might influence learning to write and how writing relates to um, speaking. I'm not going to talk about that today. So a little bit then on uh, the comparison between child-directed speech and picture books. So this is work um, uh, published last year, by, uh, first of all, by, uh, led by, by Nikki. And she found that words in children's picture books, even those, sorry, children's books, even those picture books that are targeted at preschoolers, vary or, or contrast with spoken language in quite radical ways. I think I will use the word radical, much bigger differences than I imagined there would be. There's more words, more different words, more diverse words. The words that are in book language carry a denser information content, lots of adverbs, lots of adjectives, words that just don't appear very often in, in conversations. The words are more sophisticated, they're more rare, they're more sophisticated. They're more morph morphologically complex, they're also more abstract, they're more emotionally arousing, and they're later acquired than the words that kids of the same age experience for free via child-directed speech. 
um, the paper referenced here that just published by, by Ya Ling has taken a look at the older children's reading as well and clear effects of greater syntactic complexity in written language than spoken language, particularly in the context of relative clause usage. So the differences here, let me first of all say that these differences make sense. If you think about the job of written language versus spoken language, these are very, very different beasts. So I'm talking in here in relatively sort of conversational way. Um, I'm not speaking in complete sentences. I keep losing track and restarting. I'm waving my hands around. I'm looking at people. I'm pointing. All these things are, are done to enable some sort of sense, hopefully, of shared communication in our shared situation. Obviously, that cannot happen in written language. We don't have pointing. We don't have eye contact. We don't have referent. We don't have a situation. Instead, the writer has to create the situation so that it becomes a situation in the, the mind of the reader. And the tool that they have to do this is language. And so to create the situation in the reader's mind, the language has to be altogether more complex, more structured, more dense, more diverse, more difficult than the language that we use when we're just doing, doing this. So it makes sense that there are these differences between book language and spoken language. This is not a new observation. It's been in the linguistics literature for, forever. But I think what our work has done is shown how early these differences uh, begin to emerge. I imagine that books for kids would be much more like spoken language and they gradually become more like written language, but actually they're like written language pretty early on. So differences make sense. They start early, well before children can read, and they build over time and across genre, but I've not got time to talk about that. Instead, what I want to do for the last few minutes of the lecture is to try and put together this idea about rich picture book experience and reading book experience with the sort of processing learning opportunity loop that I introduced earlier. Because now we've got the tools to make some um, connections. We've got a good handle on reading experience and we can go into the corpus and track regularities and statistics at any which level, letters, words, sentences. We've got various processing models that help us think about hypotheses and questions that we might want to test and then we can go and find the children and our paradigms to, to test out these things. And the test case I'm going to end with is one that speaks to morphology. So those who were in the symposium earlier will, um, will pick up the, some of the themes from those discussions. It also relates very much to Cathy's wonderful um, mid-career uh, lecture a few years ago, uh, Writing Systems, Reading and Language. If you haven't read this paper, you must read it. It's an absolute must read. Um, her lecture, I don't know if it's online. Were you, were you filmed? It's online. Um, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful lecture. And in it, what she highlighted was the, the extent to which morphological regularities are, are an important and a salient part of the English writing system. And she showed us through lovely examples that went right back in sort of language evolution terms and so on, these um, systematic links between written and spoken form and meaning. So there's some examples here. We've got a common thread going between locked, unlocked, locked, and lockable. Knowing something about lock helps us learn something about unlock and locked. And we've got teacher, farmer, and reader. The ER is doing something there that is a systematic regularity. What's interesting about reading and written language as opposed to spoken language is that these links between meaning and form are maintained to a greater extent in written language than I think many of us uh, would intuitively feel. Let me give you an example of that. Take the word magic and the word magician. Here, the writing system has abandoned phonological consistency or orthography phonologically consistency to favour the, the, the meaning consistency. So knowing something about magic tells us something that's useful and helpful for us to understand the word magician. And that's marked in the orthography. It's no longer, it's not marked in the sound. So Kelly proposed that learning about these regularities through reading experience might be very central to this transition from the novice reader to the expert reader. So that's what we've been picking up on and thinking about what does this experience look like and how is learning shaped? So to get a handle on what reading experience looks like, we went back to uh, corpus work. First of all, just to note that in the comparison between child-directed speech and picture books for preschoolers, 
Nikki found that in the books that were most, uh, sorry, in the words that were most indicative of book language rather than spoken language, they were much more morphologically complex than the words that were most representative of spoken language. So that's shown in the orange there is the book language words in terms of morphological complexity and the blue blob is um, spoken language morphological complexity. So even in the preschoolers experience there's more opportunity to learn about morpho morphology because there's more of it in, in writing than there is in, in listening. But for the work I'm going to describe that focuses on what the kids will be reading themselves. So these are um, lexical statistics that are extracted from the corpus for uh, kids own reading from the Oxford Children's Corpus. What, um, what Nikki did was to examine how types of complex word vary by targeted age. We can compare reading books that are written for five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. We can look at fiction, we can look at non-fiction. And Nikki, I'm sure, will be back at the EPS and talking about that work in detail at some point in the not-too-distant future. But we can also use the corpus and this work to derive frequencies for derivational suffixes and then examine how those distributions relate not only to target age and genre in terms of reading experience, but then relate that to processing in, in, in experiments. So if we have as our hypothesis becoming an expert is an emergent property of reading experience, and in particular picking up on Cathy's ideas in her lecture a few years ago about these all important links between orthography and semantics, these are important because when we read we don't want to be sounding words out, we want to get to meaning from print as quickly and as reliably as possible. And the connections between orthography and semantics allow us to do that, they're an efficient, effective way of reading. So to remind you, if we're thinking about orthography semantics, that would be the notion that we've got an uh, orthographic form green that takes us to the meaning of green. The orthographic form isn't green, green or green, it's green, spelled with a double E, there's that specificity there. Also earlier on you learned Yate and I hope you remembered that Yate is the coldest city in the world and it's Y-A-I-T that's the coldest city in the world, not any of these other imposters. That's something about these connections between orthography and semantics. So if the emergence of skilled behaviour is a consequence of the reading, behavior, the reading experience and the way that this processing encounter learning opportunity loop might work, that should be predictable from item level factors, i.e. things that we've extracted from reading experience from our corpus explorations, and also child level factors to do with how good children are at reading. Because better children are at reading, the more they read, the more they read, the more they get exposed to the statistics. The more they're exposed to the statistics, the more we should see evidence of that in our laboratory experiments. And the test case for that has been to run some experiments looking at the morpheme interference effect. So uh, this was developed uh, some time ago in adult work with uh, Davide Crepaldi and colleagues. Very simple experiment, again a lexical decision experiment. Single word appears on the screen, you make a decision, is it a word or is it a non-word? And what has been found in the morpheme interference effect is that people are slower to reject non-words that have apparent morphological structure to them. So a non-word like nutful or boxile is hard to say no to because it's more word-like. And what makes it more word-like is it's got this derivational affix on the end, full or ill. Compared with control words, control non-words like nutfill and boxage, these don't have affixes that are derivational meaningful affixes in the language. And so the effect in adults, it is harder to reject non-words that have apparent morphological structure. In work that Nikki did with Cathy and Ricketts as part, uh, and Jessie, sorry, as part of her uh, PhD work, uh, she documented the morpheme interference effect over development by looking at children, early adolescence and late adolescence. And what was really interesting in that work is that the adult-like behaviour, the adult-like signatures of the morpheme interference effect didn't emerge until amazingly late in development, 16 to 7 year old, 17 years before they were shown the adult-like behaviour. Again, so this sort of speaks to reading experience, you need a lot of exposure to reading written materials if this adult-like behaviour is going to manifest in something like the morpheme interference effect. Now, in, in, in this experiment, it was a set of um, non-words that were not informed by developmental statistics. It was a sort of um, um, item sets that people had used in adult experiments. So what 
we've been doing more recently is using the corpus statistics from children's reading experience and popping them into a morpheme interference effect experiment. I'm just going to show you one experiment. This is one very much under uh, Nikki's leadership, but with Moen Zhang, a PhD student with us in Oxford, and also um, Al Edwards, a project student, has contributed to this work. It's work in progress. So far, 57 adults and 184 adolescents. And experimental stimuli, which use frequent... Um, derivational affixes that vary in frequency according to these developmental statistics. Classic design with pretend morphemic non-words and control items. To get at child level factors or person level factors we also assess the children's, the people's uh, reading ability using the RAW, the online assessment of reading ability. So we've got the morpheme interference effect and then these two measures of, uh, of um, uh, a variation, one at the item level to do with frequency from the corpus, the other to do with the child level or participant level factor, how good they are at reading. So I'm just going to show you some very hot off the press data from Moen from last week. So this is showing the morpheme interference effect loud and clear. It's a sizable effect here. This is in reaction time on the left and accuracy on the right. And it's shown here in interaction with frequency. So the red line is the control condition and the blue line is the uh, pseudo-morphemic condition. And as you can see, the blue lines, the reaction time is slower. People find it hard to re reject these non-words that have apparent morphological structure. And accuracy goes down. They, find they make more errors. But the interaction tells us that there's a very clear frequency effect here. So frequency is plotted along the horizontal axis. The higher the frequency, the suffix, the harder it is to reject that word. So the more, the more familiar it is to you, the more interfering it is, the more it gets in the way of you saying no to, the, to that lexical decision item. You're slower and you're more accurate as frequency increases. There is also an interaction between the morpheme interference effect and um, reading ability. So again, we can see similar plots. What's plotted here is the raw score, uh, the raw score on the raw. Um, nice lexical ambiguity for you, Jenny, raw and raw. Um, and uh, 80 is a higher score. The better the readers, the more um, substantial the effect of condition, the morpheme interference effect. See that in accuracy, in reaction time, not significantly so in um, accuracy. And then there was also a three-way interaction in the, uh, the data. So there was the morpheme condition by reading ability by frequency. So here we've got um, categorised into low, medium and high familiarity in each panel of the, um, the figure. And what you can see is all of the action really is in this sort of cell here on the right hand side with bigger interference effects uh, as a function of reading ability. You get bigger interference if you're better at reading and you also get bigger interference if it's a high frequency um, uh, suffix. And that is also the same pattern is shown in... Um, in um, accuracy. So begin to pull things together. Becoming expert is an emergent property of reading experience. It allows us to build these mappings between orthography and semantics. And I hope that experiment there, very much work in progress, obviously we need to go younger in age to test that more, is it gives you an example of how we can unite corpus explorations with processing models and experimental um, effects. So becoming a reader, becoming a reader, let's wrap things up. I've made a case, I hope, about the importance of, leading, of learning from reading experience. This isn't a simple practice effect. It's something much more important and much more interesting than that in psychological terms. Exposure to written language is the substrate that's a reflection of learning, but it's also the driver of learning. Essentially, what learning to read requires us to do is to begin to embody the statistics that are in the writing system and get them into the mind of the reader so that they become to, to sort of mirror each other. And when we unpack it reading experience, I think there are really important lessons from the book language work, because that is what reading experience looks like. And I think for too long we've been looking at single words and looking at forgetting about the contextual history of those single words and that they're single words in our experiment, but they bring with them baggage. They bring with them the baggage that they've ex they have as a function of your previous experience with them. And so combining experiments that consider this baggage in tightly controlled experiments is a way, hopefully, to help us understand how learning might happen. Now, it would be wrong of me not to come back to instruction and individual differences right at the very end. I really want to 
make clear that I've not given anybody the impression that a rich, you know, experience with book language is, is what's needed and we just put our children in front of a beautiful library of picture books and they will read. They will not. Instruction is needed to kickstart the system. There's lots of interesting and important questions about how much instruction, how instruction should work, whether it should be explicit and all sorts of things there, but instruction really, really matters. After then, experience can do its job. I suspect the starter kit for instruction will turn out to be perhaps a little bit smaller than, than, than some recent work might suggest, but it's absolutely critical that that small starter set is there and then experience can do its job. Learning and memory can take over in the principles of learning and memory. I should also talk about individual differences. This is obviously not all in experience. There are huge differences in experience. Some children sadly go to school without having any experience of shared reading in the preschool years, which is a huge tragedy and a big societal issue, I think. Huge variation in experience, but there's also variation in other things as well. Children differ, people differ. There might be fundamental differences in some um, components of learning and memory that are important for us to think about. Associative learning, perceptual learning, phonological analysis, language learning, a whole range of things, these basic processes which are going to influence the extent to which children can bring, can build knowledge from their reading experience opportunities. Their reading experience opportunities will depend on what they're reading, the te textual experience, the sorts of books they read, the number of times they read them, and also the sorts of instruction that they may or may not have. But together, those basic processes and the knowledge are, again, a continuous loop mutually influencing each other that brings about variation in word reading ability. And if we keep going round and round that in time, that is reading development. So I'll come back to my knot, the knotty problem of learning to read. We have to untie it, we have to look at it in this sort of uh, separate way, but ultimately we need to make sure we tie the ends very tightly because reading is a very tightly tied knot. Okay, so let me finish with some um, acknowledgements. I'm not going to thank my research group, um, present, past and future. Um, suffice, suffice to say, I've, I'm very grateful for the people who've contributed to the work that I've presented today and everybody who comes before them, Joe and Jesse, for the wonderful symposium today. Thank you. But as I reflected on getting the um, Mid-Career Award, I thought there's no getting away from the fact that I am now a middle-aged person, which is you know, not very nice, but here we are. Um, but it also made me reflect on the mid-career people that were absolutely um, instrumental in shaping my career and providing opportunities for that little brownie growing up in South Staffordshire that she would, would never have imagined. So it's um, 20 years since I joined the Oxford department, uh, which has been a learning experience, certainly lots of challenges over the way, certainly lots of learning opportunities over the way, um, and the three heads of department here. Um, sadly, I suspect many of you know, Oliver died um, earlier this year, and this is the first EPS meeting with, with, without him being with us. And I'm sure the society will have ways to honour his memory and his legacy um, in due course. Thinking back to my own foundational department at the University of York, where I was before um, going to Oxford, um, mid-career people do so much to build an environment that allows young people to thrive and learn and I was certainly very lucky to benefit from both of these departments. A particular shout out to my supervisor Charles Hume. I should also acknowledge St John's College. When I went to the EP department in Oxford I had no idea what was going to greet me at St John's College but it's been a very happy experience and also a shout out to my postdoc mentor Maggie Snowling who's been really instrumental in supporting my career in numerous ways. It was funny I went to left York to go to Oxford and then 10 years later she rocks up and I have a little bit of York uh, in Oxford. And finally, there's one mentor here that it doesn't make this list because uh, she's not been a head of department and she's not been sort of official in any way, but in so many ways, she's a mentor to us all and a, and a role model to us all. And that's Dorothy Bishop. And anybody who's been following on, on Twitter will perhaps realise it's her retirement day today. So we're here engaging in academic debate. Dorothy is in a wine bar in Oxford uh, toasting her, her happy retirement. And so a shout out uh, to uh, a festival that we're organising for her. Imagine yourself at the Royal Society in June on the terrace, glass of wine, beautiful sunshine, two days of wonderful science and tributes to, to Dorothy. So please mark that in your diaries and come along. And also to acknowledge the EPS for their generous support of, of that event. 
And I'll just leave you with a few thoughts on book language to fill the screen. But thank you, EPS, for everything you do. Thank you, Kate, for such a wonderful talk. I mean, it was really a, just an absolute treat tonight. And I think, you know, everything I said in my introduction about, you know, the communication, the elegant experiments, you know, you've taken a nutty problem and you've, you've told a story with such simplicity and precision, um, creativity. And what I didn't mention in my introduction was the fun, right? <laughs> just the fun. Um, and I think we all loved it. Um, so thank you very much. It's just a total honor to have you here tonight. So will you take some questions? Of course. Oh, do we have questions? We, do we, oh, Jeff, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, say something nice, no, I won't. <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything more. <laughs> so the, the last experiment, the, you mentioned interactive reading ability. Um, are you thinking that is literally ability, like something like decoding speed or a sentence span, or is that a proxy for a reading experience for a reading? Yeah, so actually that's a, a, a good opportunity for me to say something that I've forgotten because I think something that's important to remember is that reading ability drives reading experience. And there's really quite convincing evidence now, I think, from behavioural genetics that the factor here is that reading ability, the, more, the better you are at reading, the more you read and then you get these rich encounters that might shape how the system develops. But reading experience in itself doesn't bring about good reading in and of itself. There's something more basic going on. So the test that, was, that we, we used there was a very simple one word at a time, lexical decision type thing. So it's very much a proxy for how good a person is at reading. Generally reading, it's pretty stable, it's pretty reliable, it correlates with everything that it should do. So how good kids are at reading those words or you know, making decisions about those words in the moment correlates pretty well with everything else. So I, here it's just a proxy for reading experience rather than anything more particular. That said, I think we all could imagine experiments where you do things at an item level that would be quite nice because you would predict what a child knows about a word should be predicted in their behaviour. And so you could do things at a much more item level that we and others have done in some experiments, but in this, no, it's just a proxy. Other questions? I have a question, and that is, I mean, you've, you've talked to us about the book language, mm -hmm. and, you know, literacy is such a recent invention, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's not, a, it's not an invention that's, literacy is not a universal part of human experience, mm -hmm. right? And I just wonder, you know, we've had a whole symposium about statistical learning. Mm -hmm. To what extent, you know, the, the literacy, the book language has changed our spoken language mm -hmm. over, you know, the time course of... Yeah. of of literacy and, and mm -hmm. you know across cultures. I mean, do we mm -hmm. do we speak a book language? Yeah. So, a couple of things to say. That I think it's a really interesting. I mean, it makes me want to go into sort of anthropology or something <laughs> to think about these things. So, a couple of things. One is there's really big genre effects. So, um, how close written language is to spoken language depends on the sort of genre thing and academic language, legal language, you know, they're as far away from spoken conversation as you can imagine, but there's every sort of variation in between. But there has been a little bit of reporting about languages that have a, that are, are languages, proper languages, but they don't have a writing system, and then a writing system gets introduced. So there's some country, I've forgotten where, or, which can, what the name of the country, an African country where it didn't have a writing system and in about 1970 the state decided it would have a writing system. So a writing system was made up and people then tracked the development and evolution of the writing system but also tracked spoken language over time and spoken language has indeed changed as a function of learning of exposure to written language. So the way people are using language does seem to be a consequence of what they've read in, in that sort of way. But I don't know very much work in that tradition but it's really fun to think about. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. And obviously, being able to access information through book, uh, through text is so important in life. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought about how sort of 
more of the work I've done is it's a kind of streamlining instruction you can learn, but mm -hmm. also how you know you get these big effects and big gaps and sort of social inequality that you're not exposed to. Mm -hmm. effects, and yeah. Maybe missing this qualitative difference. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the kind of work that you've been doing might inform how we can almost We've worked on sort of streamlining instruction. Is there a way to kind of streamline exposure? Do you think this might help us work out, like, if you are from, you know, mm -hmm. a, a social background so where you, you don't have lots of fixed analysis, lots of intervention? Yeah. If you're not going to get a lot of exposures, what's going to be really needed to, yeah. to kind of start playing yeah. those gaps? Very much so. That's something that we've been thinking about a lot in the Nuffield project. I don't know if Nikki mentioned her registered report study, but if not, you should connect about that, because ex exactly that. So, or should I repeat the question? Yeah. So, so sorry. Um, the, the, the question really was about whether um, our work has got, got, provides any insights about whether we can streamline and target intervention um, early on for those kids who might not have had sex exposure um, to, to the book language. So, yeah. And that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do and think about. I mean, we know generally that reading develops out of spoken language. How good you are at language, how much language you have is an important, massive predictor of how the reading system develops. Now, I think some of that language experience is actually book language experience, and that will be interesting to unpack. I don't know, if Patrick, if that's something you can do in your developmental computational models with age of acquisition and think about whether some of these words are book words, even though the kids are hearing them rather than reading them. But it really speaks to the fact that some children go to school and their, their exposure to written language via shared reading is absolutely minimal. And we, we know that people have done, spent a long time trying to do a shared reading interventions in the hope that they'll then push the kids' language further on and then, as a consequence, push their, liter their literacy further on. There are effects. They're pretty small. They're not particularly long-standing. And there's also some discussion about what the active ingredients is. Is it, is it the book? Is it the shared attention? Is it the emotional connection? Is it the extra text talk? So a lot of work's gone into saying, OK, it's not enough just to read to your children. You have to do all this extra text talk. You have to scaffold. You have to ask them questions. And I think that's a demanding intervention for people who might not have good language themselves. So what we think is, how much can we make the text do the work? And, and say, if all you do, all you have, you don't have any extra text talk, but you just have access to the, to the language of books via a shared reading experience, exposure, can we tailor that so that kids at five, when they go to school, get access to the language that they've missed? So rather than any old spoken language, what is it about book language that we can put into those early um, uh, interventions to try and optimise learning potential by targeting what they've missed? And that's exactly what Nikki's registered report paper is, is all about. So we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, hi. Yeah, thanks very much, Kate. That was really interesting and also very moving presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I was thinking about the other part to children's reading books, which is all the pictures. Mm. So my children will refuse to read a book unless it mm. has pictures in it. Mm. That's, that's the, mm -hmm. uh, the incentive for them, mm -hmm. that they're able to, to you know, follow yeah. some of the meaning through those pictures. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering about how you see the language fitting in with the rest of the, uh, yeah. the experience of the information and the, the narrative that's told yeah. in many of their Yeah. Yeah, a couple of thoughts there. First of all, I think the pictures are narrative, and this is about narrative, you know, and I guess the pictures, I don't know, I see language, you know, I'm a language first person, so I think that the, the, the narrative in pictures is language, but, you know, I know people will argue with me on that, but that, that could be really important because it's meaning and it's an episode and it, it's stuff, and whether you talk about it, whether you deal it with, you know, it is part of the, the experience and episode. I think pictures in children's books have got a bad press because people think about shared reading, about opportunities to learn to read. And of course it isn't, it's about creating the language and then the reading comes later. And so there is work that's looked at how much children look at the pictures as they hear in the stories. And of course, of course they look at the pictures and they don't really follow the words. That doesn't matter unless you're hoping that they're going to pay attention to the words, the written words sort of thing. So it would be, you know, we're not looking at pictures at all. I think we've got all, we took all the pictures, didn't we, in the corpus, they're all in there. Uh, and we've also got speech as well mark, marked, and we haven't looked at, uh, at that. But it would be, you know, interesting to look at and think about um, how the pictures interact with the, the language and whether that can be optimised. I should say in Nikki's registered report, there were absolutely beautiful illustrations, but we've tried to 
capture the narrative but not focus on the thing that the kids are having to learn. We try to make sure that the learning is in the language but that the pictures are beautiful and create the, the situation but not the bit that's being tested in the experiment. And then, I guess the pictures are giving you information about some of the text but mm -hmm. they're not giving you information about the syntax. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Final question for Joe. Um, I guess we've been hearing mostly about children, and I just wondered about um, university students and the fact that a lot of learning is now from videos mm -hmm. and uh, podcasts and mm -hmm. stuff, and they wouldn't use necessarily be in the same type of language as reading a textbook mm -hmm. or a yeah. paper or something. And mm -hmm. I wondered whether you thought that what what you thought the impact that might be, yeah. whether it's interesting. Yeah, so I, I forgot to repeat Patrick's question, but Joe's question is about uh, university students and when lots of their language exposure is via podcasts and YouTube and, and things, you know, what, 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 what do we think about that? Well, I think we all mark student essays. We, we, we know what we think about that. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, these things are not good or bad, are they? It depends what you're listening to. The kids who are not reading... A, not able to read very well. Listening to audiobooks is going to be fantastic because it's going to give them all that language exposure um, that they're not able to get because they're writing, their reading, word reading ability limits access to that. So while they're still working out how the word reading works, they can still get their rich language comprehension through audiobooks. Probably less so for podcasts than YouTube because they are more conversational. So again, you're just going to get the conversational language. You're not going to get the syntactic structures and the amazing diversity and nuance in vocabulary. You know, the podcast will say, you know, said this, said that, said that. When you read, you get whisper, yell, shriek, and all sorts of words that are synonyms and nuances and shades of meaning that the writer chooses to create the situation. You don't need to do that when you just have a cafe said Joe said you know, So audiobooks, yes, podcasts, yeah. <laughs> I think we should leave it there and thank Kate again for a fabulous lecture. Thank you.